thank you everyone for joining us tonight um wherever you may be i hope you're safe hope you're well um in the uk this is a bank holiday so especially grateful for our um people giving up their bank holiday evenings and, and coming to hear about um the experiences of a stem cell recipient um we particularly have a number of email uh, registrations from Germany, um, which Julia has explained could potentially be her family. Um, <laughs> <That's> likely. <laughs> but could also be because uh, Germany has, you know, a, mu a much better um, registration rate for, for stem cell donors. So, um, you know, everyone's welcome. So thank you very much. Germany's a great example to us. Um, so my name's Rhys, I'm a lecturer in biomedical science at the University of Sussex. Um, I'm also a AML researcher, acute myeloid leukemia, which is um, important for today's session, uh, as we'll hear more, um, more about. Um, and a disclaimer at the start is I'm also myself uh, a stem cell donor. So four years ago, I donated my stem cells. Um, so I come from this from a very biased perspective, a very sort of pro, pro stem cell donation. Um, so I'm sorry if I bang on about it too much tonight, but hopefully the, the story we have for you tonight will be self, you know, the, it'll be self-evident of how important uh, stem cell donation is. Um, another disclaimer is like all of us, I'm trying to do this from home. Um, so I have a load of screaming kids outside my window here. Um, so sorry if you pick up any, um, any screaming children sounds there's nothing not, not a lot i can really do about that at the moment but <laughs> hopefully it won't interrupt us too much um so last in last night's session um we talked to alistair stewart who is uh, an Anthony nolan stem cell donor and we talked about the experience of donating stem cells and we talked about the various processes which are involved right from sign up through to donation and then post donation um, and that was great. Um, and we learned, uh, I interjected with a bit of science explaining the process as well. Um, but the purpose of tonight's session is to try and get, um, try and get the perspective of someone who's received um, a stem cell donation or a stem cell transplant for uh, a treatment of a blood cancer. And I just want to make it absolutely clear from the start, um, who I'm about to introduce, Julia, has not received Alistair's stem cells. Um, that would be highly unethical if we were talking about that inside two years, and it didn't happen anyway. So uh, this is a completely unrelated donation and a completely unrelated story, but a really important story to tell to let you know the importance of um, stem cell donation. So, um, as I mentioned at the start, um, you'll all be on mute. If you could stay on mute, that'd be great so it doesn't interrupt the conversation. This is being recorded, um, which we're going to upload to social media uh, after the session for those who couldn't make it. And towards the end of the session as well, if for, any, for those of you who are familiar with Zoom, um, at the bottom there is a, a chat option. Feel free to ask questions as, as you go along, if they come into your head about any part of Julia's story or stem cell donation. Um, we, won't ask, we won't actually answer them till the end because we want to try and make sure that we get finished within an hour. And if we bounce between questions, we might go off track a little bit, but we'll do our best to answer questions at the end. Uh, that'd be okay, Julia? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, yeah, so just, just type them in the chat bar and we'll pick them up as they come along. Um, so yeah, we're just going to talk through... Uh, Julia's story. So first of all, Julia, um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I, we know this is a busy week for you because you should be revising for your exams. <laughs> it's uh, a break. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully it's a bit of a, a welcome break for you. Um, so first of all, do you want to introduce yourself, um, how old you are, where you're from uh, and what you're currently doing in life? Sure. So my name's Julia. I'm 20 years old. Um, and I study medical neuroscience at Sussex. Excellent. Um, and we first met, it was quite interesting, wasn't it? Um, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I was giving one of my first year lectures on something completely unrelated to blood cancer. Something, probably something to do with a cytoskeleton or something completely. Something like that, some cell biology module. <laughs> yeah, but it was a good lecture, right, Julia? That's the important thing. It was brilliant. I learned <laughs> so much. <laughs> um, and you came up to me after and you said, um, oh, Reese, uh, nice to meet you. And you do AML research, don't you? 
uh, and I said, yeah, I do AML research. And um, you said, I had AML. <laughs> <laughs> and you completely rocked my world when you said that, because I've obviously I've been studying the disease for the best part of 15 years now. And I've never actually really met someone with AML before. I've been to various open days, fundraising events, and this, we know there's people there with various blood cancers. But um, yeah, you, I, I didn't expect the first person for me to meet who had AML would be someone as young as yourself. So it was a real, it was a real shock. Yeah, it's, well, it's obviously super rare in my age group. There's only a handful of cases a year. Um, yeah. You know, most people who have AML are well above 60 or 70 even. Um, so, you know, obviously when I was diagnosed, it was a massive shock. I wasn't expecting it. And no one does when you're, I was 18 at the time when I was diagnosed. Um, and the symptoms aren't really sort of, they're not that odd, really. Yeah, we'll, we'll come on to that. Mm -hmm. But because it is, you know, they are quite, well, it's just the last thing you think, isn't it? When you've got the kind of generic symptoms that, that you receive. But I just wonder before we sort of go into that, I mean, what, could you tell us a little bit about growing up as a child? I mean, you know, no one ever expects to get uh, leukemia, but, um, <laughs> you know, any, you know how, how was life as a child? And were you a healthy child? Yeah, um, I had basically no health problems. I didn't even have asthma. I've never had hay fever before. Um, you know, it, it, there was literally nothing. Uh, I had my wisdom teeth out when I was 15, but, you know, sort of. Yeah, um, I grew up in London. Both my parents are doctors, actually. So it ended up sort of, I think, sort of saving my life in the end. Um, I was fairly active. I did a lot of dance and musicals at school. Um, and sort of when I started feeling really tired all the time, I was, I mean, I was doing musicals at uni and I was doing a science degree. So I thought, OK, maybe I'm a bit stressed. Um, but I also had bruises everywhere. And I mean, I haven't been to medical school, so I wouldn't know, but apparently it's not that normal. And I spoke to my dad maybe a week before I was diagnosed and he said, how are you feeling about the show next week? And I said, actually, I don't know. I'm feeling really strange. Sort of, I, I, like, I'm not having trouble sleeping and... How old are you at this point, Julia? I mean, so I was 18. I was, in the first, I was also in my first year at uni. Yeah. Um, and so this was February 2019. So you've just, February 19, so you're sort of three or four months into university. Yeah, so I'd, I'd just done my first round of exams in January. Choice of university as well, the University of Sussex, of course. Um, Absolutely. Um, and <laughs> so this is the point you're starting to realise things aren't quite right. Well, I didn't really think much of it, to be honest. Um, I sort of excused all my symptoms. I thought, well, of course I'm stressed. I'm doing music and a musical and a science degree. Um, so I'm probably quite anxious and stressed about a lot of things going on and I have bruises because I'm helping to build set and there are props in a lot of the dance numbers so I'm you know there's things flying around backstage and a lot of the other girls also have bruises and cuts and we've all fallen over and um, I, I, yes, I, I spoke to my dad and he said the bruises kind of worried him yeah. And he said I needed to go get a blood test to see what was up, if it was something serious. And you say um, your dad was a, a GP, a doctor? Or? He's an eye surgeon, actually. So completely not his area, you know, his yeah, specialty or anything. But... And, you know, no, knows when things aren't quite right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I went, to, uh, I went to the GP and I saw a nurse at first. This was the triage system. Uh, how it works and I told her my symptoms and she said well she didn't think that it was urgent enough to see a doctor she didn't she didn't think that you know whatever um yeah. and so she bit me for a blood test for a week later and this was five days before I was diagnosed um, on, and I, on sort of university campus or is this a, a hospital or I went to the campus GP yeah and um so I, I sort of started rolling up my sleeves so you know, get her to draw blood. And she said, oh no, it has to be booked in. It has to be done in a week's time. I said, why can't we do it now? She said, it's just not the way it's done here. So I said, okay, fine. Yeah. So I went home and then the, as the week went on, I started feeling worse and worse and more tired. And my dad said, just go to A&E because they'll most likely do a blood test right there and then, and then we'll know what's, what's up. So I said to my flatmate, I said, okay, I'm going to the hospital tomorrow morning, but not to worry. I'll be back in a few hours. I'm sure it's nothing. And she said, well, I'll go with you. And I said, really, no, it's fine. She insisted on coming with me. Um, and my dad said to go really early in the morning at sort of eight because there would be no wait 
on a weekend and I'd be the first to be seen. So we set our alarms really early. I got up and I was, I remember feeling so exhausted when I woke up that I almost wasn't going to go, but I already had my flatmate in the kitchen. And honestly, the only, the only reason I got up was because she already got, she had already gotten up. Yeah. Um, so we both went to the hospital and I saw a nurse who immediately took bloods and did an ECG and cause my heart rate was quite high. And, yeah. uh, three hours later, a hematologist came and told me that she thought I had leukemia. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in your head there leading up to the, that sort of hammer blow moment, you're thinking of everything else it could be. Yeah. I mean, that isn't, that hasn't even entered your thought process, has it really? I mean, funnily enough, when I spoke to my dad on the phone, I said, I mean, are you worried? What's the worst thing it could be? And he said, well, worst case scenario, it could be leukemia. But it won't be that, you know, it's so rare. And so when she was kind of going through my blood results, I was like, well, it could, maybe it could be, I don't know. And then she said it. And I, I don't know if I was just in disbelief or I hadn't registered what she said, but I actually asked her if I could go back and finish my musical before I started treatment. <laughs> um, you just couldn't process it, right? Yeah, yeah. And she sort of said, do you, do you understand what I've just said to you? And I said, yeah, no, I know. But I mean, you know, the musical is really important to me. So I'd love to be able to do that. And then it kind of sunk in. So it was, it was just a weird day. You know, there was I mean, no, no emotion. No, I can't describe it in any way. No, no, it's very difficult. I mean, so let's say a few hours or a few days goes past. I mean, what, what are you feeling when you get that diagnosis? What, what? thought process or empty head what trigger thoughts you get in when you hear things like leukemia I knew basically nothing about it um when I was told I knew it was a cancer but I, I mean I didn't really understand what sort of cancer I obviously hadn't hadn't studied anything about it I didn't really know yeah. um and sort of when they told me it was in my bone marrow I said okay but is it a tumor and they said no it's sort of cancer cells that develop in your bone marrow and that affects all your cancer that's why you're feeling so yeah, it's often quite confusing because it? it's actually a fluid tumor it's not yeah tumor. the concept of a fluid tumor can yeah exactly like get your head round, can it yeah definitely um so at this point i just if you don't mind you i'll just interject um just explain a little bit about uh, the type of leukemia that you were have been suffering from mm -hmm. um i'm going to share my desktop hopefully everyone can see this so that um So uh, we'll talk, come on to what leukemia is, but I just want to briefly go over this. So we, 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 I gave this slide last night for the donation session. I just want to quickly go through it because, again, we talk about stem cells and I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page with stem cells. So specifically, we are referring to um, hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, it's a very fancy word for blood, if you like. And these are very special cells. Um, they're incredibly rare. They live in the bone marrow. They, may, they can be as frequent as one in every sort of 20,000 cells. So they're extremely rare. And they have the capacity to either self-renew, which is basically producing an exact copy of itself, or they can take these um, intermediate developmental, developmental decisions and eventually progress to these um, mature blood cell types. Some of them I'm sure you recognize, you know, red blood cells that carry the oxygen, platelets which are responsible for clotting the blood um, and these various immune cells here um, granulocytes which make up part of your innate immunity and then the lymphocytes which make up part of your adaptive immunity and blood development can either uh, proceed down the myeloid lineage or it can proceed down the lymphoid uh, lineage so you can think when these stem cells progress through this developmental cascade they gradually lose the capacity uh, to self-renew or produce copies of themselves and they gradually gain the capacity to become well, undergo differentiation or that's a fancy word for they they become mature if you like so what happens in leukemia then is um, you get genetic damage to these stem or these progenitor cells um, in the form of genetic mutations chromosomal translocations or another type of um, DNA problem we refer to called epigenetic alterations and that converts those early stem cells to leukemia stem cells okay and 
instead of, uh, so this manifests itself as a, as a block in development. So instead of getting these nice, healthy, mature cells, which, forms, which perform specific functions in the body, you just get the uh, accumulation of these uh, completely dysfunctional blasts. Uh, we refer to them as blasts, leukemic blasts. Um, and in this particular example, which I've shown, this would be a myeloid leukemia because it's affecting the myeloid side of blood development. Um, so that's a brief overview of, of leukemia. So um, just moving on to the specific type of leukemia that Julia was diagnosed with. So this is acute myeloid leukemia. It's acute because it, it develops really quickly. And you can hear from Julia's symptoms that, you know, she really get, did go quite downhill in a week or so. Um, and it affects the myeloid lineage, so it's acute myeloid leukemia. Um, this is the most common acute leukemia in adults. In the UK, there's about 3,000 cases of it every year. It's predominantly a disease of the elderly, so it has a median presentation age of 65. There's a slight male bias with it, and it's really characterized by the uh, accumulation of um, these myeloid committed cells, these blasts, just a rapid accumulation of them. And people working on AML have always acknowledged what a very heterogeneous disease it is. So heterogeneous means different, if you like. So just how different it is in, in the terms of how it presents, how it's treated, what people go on to suffer with it, um, and the risk involved with it. So it, it really is a very heterogeneous disease. And I think a few years ago, it was sort of definitively proved that actually this is a collection of completely distinct diseases, uh, each one presenting it in a you know, very different way. And I just pulled up these statistics from uh, Cancer Research UK, their website, just to show you the increase uh, as you get older, the increase in incidence uh, of AML in the UK. And you can, really can see how unlucky you were, Julia, because uh, <laughs> you would be down here, wouldn't you? Um, yeah. In the 15 to 19 bracket and a female. So we're talking a handful of people a year, aren't we really? Yeah, Possibly. super, super rare. Really rare. Um, so what would you see in an AML patient? Well, first, if we were to look at a nor inside a normal bone marrow, what you'd see is um, a range of different cell types, all different shapes, different sizes, all at different stages of development that all have different functions. If you look inside a, a marrow of someone who's suffering from AML, what you'll see is the dominance of these dark staining blasts. And they're the real cell type which causes most of the problems in leukemia. Um, so we talked briefly there, Julia, about some of the symptoms that you might suffer. Um, some of them are very broad, just a blood cancer in general, and they are just very sort of unspectacular symptoms, aren't they? I mean, you get sort of rapid weight loss, loss of appetite, fatigue or breathlessness, fever or night sweats, prolonged and frequent infections. You know, they're things that you might not even bother troubling a GP with, but of course you should. Um, more serious complications are around the inability of proper blood cells being produced. Um, so anemia happens because there's no red blood cells being formed and that's why Julia said that she was feeling very tired, that her heart rate started to increase because it started to become very difficult to transport oxygen around her body. Thrombocytopenia, so this is a lack of platelets or thrombocytes, that's where the bleeding and the, the excess bruising would have come from. Persistent infection uh, through the inability to have any properly functioning white blood cells. And also you might start to see when it really starts to get out of control, organ infiltration. You can see a little bit here in this sort of grim picture, I'm sorry to bother you with, but the, that, the sheer mass of leukemic blasts starts to infiltrate organs and, and tissues elsewhere in the body. And very commonly death will be very quick unless um, you know caused by bone marrow or multiple organ failure, just if, intervention doesn't come soon enough through drugs or as we're going to talk about a stem cell transplant. Um, so I'm going to stop my share there. I need to get rid of that. Go back to you, Julia. Um, how does it sort of feel seeing the, the science of it? Does that make it a bit weirder? 
you're probably quite an expert on AML now. <laughs> yeah, so after 10 months or so, of, you know, lots of doctors have been <laughs> having it explained to me, you get, you get a bit of a knack for it. <laughs> yeah, you could probably come in and start giving some of my third year AML lectures now, actually. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what was the impact of that diagnosis then on, on you, the family? I mean, what just... Um, I mean, I always say that it's a lot worse for the people around me than it is for me because all I had to do was sort of take chemo and get better, but everyone else had to sort of wait for me to get better. And obviously it must have been really difficult, but no one ever showed it. You know, everyone was super strong with me and, and they were really supportive the whole time. I always had someone staying over with me, whether it's my parents, my brothers, or my friend. And um, I was luck pretty lucky that a few of my friends were uh, in London on a gap year. so. Even during term time, they were able to sort of come and, and, and be with me at the hospital. It was just amazing having that support network there. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, we, we had a brief conversation on the phone this week, didn't we? Um, yeah. And you said that your parents were actually in another country at the time, at the diagnosis. Yeah, they were, they were out of the country when I was diagnosed. And I, um, they were luckily sort of on the way to the airport um, yeah. when I got the call. So it wasn't, you know, nothing was cut short. <laughs> But um, yeah, I was transferred on the day um, from Sussex, where I was diagnosed, to London um, to have my treatment, just so I could be closer to home. And I actually was um, on a specialist team ward. At the Royal Sussex County Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, I was just thinking it from your parents' perspective. I mean, being stuck in wherever they, a different country, and then to hear that down the phone that their daughter has um, a leukemia that's quite, presumably quite advanced. Couldn't have been um, easy, I'm sure, but my parents are just amazing this whole year. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty incredible things that you've been through. Um, so once we got over the initial shock then, um, what was the uh, initial treatment plan? Um, what were the initial discussions around that? So everything happened pretty quickly. Um, I was taken to London on a Saturday and then two days later on Monday, they took uh, a biopsy of my bone marrow. Um, they did some genetic analysis, which came back two weeks later, but I'd already done a chemo cycle by then. They said that we need to get you started on chemo because um, your blood count is so high um, and we need to really bring that down um, and sort of get rid of the, the blasts that are in your bone marrow at the moment. And then, um, so they said that obviously there's a possibility of me needing a transplant, but they won't know until a couple of weeks later. Um, and then it turned out that I had what's called high risk disease um, because I had a couple of really nasty mutations yeah. um, that sort of presented in my um, analysis. So this is one of the diagnostic tests, isn't it? They look at your um, chromosomal arrangement to see if there's any problems. And I think you mentioned to me that you had a a piece of chromosome seven missing is that is that correct yeah it, they called it 7q minus but yeah that's yeah and then the other mutation i had was flit three um which apparently is quite well not quite common but it's not uncommon no um, it, it's the most frequent genetic mutation in aml yeah um and sort of because they know that it's a bit of a nasty one they said transplant would probably be a good way to go otherwise i might just keep relapsing because the mutations are so aggressive um but 7q minus they really don't know much about because i guess they've discovered it recently that it's sort of a, a nasty mutation um and they said that sort of transplant would probably give me the best shot at a good prognosis so did you have any sort of anything immediately to relieve some of the symptoms you're already facing um apart from chemo I mean, I had regular platelet transfusions and blood transfusions um, because obviously my bone was kind of wiped out with a chemo, so I couldn't make any myself. Um, and my, <laughs> my first week or so at the hospital, my hemoglobin was so low that I kept fainting, so I had to have someone always with me go to the toilet and, you know. <laughs> so even the most, even the simple tasks, going to the toilet, were... Just... Yeah, it's amazing. My hemoglobin, I came in and it was 53, which is about a third of what it should be, so... I mean, try, trying to go up the stairs with that was just sort of really difficult. Yeah. Wow. So um, at what point was stem cell mentioned, transplant, um, donate, you know, donor, you know, HLA yeah. match? How, how, when did those sort of things start to get mentioned? So as soon as they told me that I had these nasty mutations, they pretty much said that I'll be going for a transplant. It wasn't really a sort of, if you want, it was sort of a, that's, that's the treatment that we're giving you. Um, I didn't really know much about stem cells or stem cell transplants at this point. I kind of knew what any A-level biologist knew, that they're sort of 
unspecialized cells that divide in meiosis and in development, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I you should have known at that point. Yeah. And I, I obviously had no idea that they could be transplanted from a donor, even a stranger into me. And that would sort of help. I really, I didn't understand. I didn't know anything about it at that point. Um, and both of my brothers, my younger brothers were tested, but neither of them were a match for me. I mean, so not Two younger brothers. Okay. Um, they're two and four years younger than I am. So at the time they were 16 and 14. And they were both a half match, so five out of ten. Um, but apparently I think it's they said that it was a sort of a 25% chance that either of them would actually be a match. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. They weren't surprised by it in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so it's just some scary terms being banded about, and they must have been, you know, you must have been quite at risk because you know, only the, only the very youngest patients will go off or be considered for a stem cell transplant because it is such a brutal procedure, as we'll come on to in a bit. And there's also financial considerations as well. So on average, it costs between fifty and £150,000 to perform one of these stem cell transplants. Wow. With, all, with all drugs, with all the uh, care, uh, care that's needed afterwards. Um, so it's a real big consideration for a, a medical team to, to go down that route. So... I wouldn't be surprised if it was a, a scary thing to, to um, you know, to find out about. Yeah. Um, so just while we're there, I'm just going to share my screen again, because I'm just going to briefly bring in some facts, again, from the anti Nolan website about stem cell donation. So about every 14 minutes or so, everyone, someone is diagnosed with a blood cancer. That's uh, 104 people a day. And there's about 2,000 people in the UK every year who are in need of a bone marrow or a stem cell transplant. Um, and I must say, uh, not, it's not always blood cancers that people need stem cell transplants for. So there are also some inherited anemias um, and also some autoimmune conditions. Um, so just to get you thinking, that it's, you know, it's not all about cancer of why a, a stem cell donation might be required. Um, about five people every day uh, start their search for a, a matched um, unrelated stem cell donor. Um, that's because, in, and especially in your case, Julie, about 75% of UK patients won't find a matching donor in their own family. Um, and anti, just again, to plug the work of Anti Nolan, they, they uh, found donors for 13,000 people last year to give them a second chance. So that's obviously fantastic work. Um, and these two points were made in last night's donation session, uh, which I'd like to drum home again here. So um, about 70% of patients are able to find a match, but this drops quite considerably uh, to 20% if you're a BAME patient. So black, uh, Asian, minority ethnic patient. And that's because the HLA type in, which again, we talked about last night, and hopefully you can find out more when we upload the video from that session. The HLA type in is, is much more difficult with um, mixed genetic backgrounds. Um, and again, a point here that 16% uh, of um, the register in the UK is made up of uh, young males, but that's actually not good enough because over half of the donations that are required uh, need to be from males or they provide over half of the donations. So we really need to get those numbers up. Um, young males, 16 to 30, we really need to step up and, and, and get more of us onto the register. I say us, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> below 30 anymore, but um, let's, uh, I can still make the case. Um, and again, some great work from Auntie Nolan, they give about three people a day, you know, a second chance at life. So that's really um, fantastic work that they do. Um, so as we move on to talk about the transplant then, um, Julia, I just wanna make uh, just a few points about the different types of stem cell transplant, tra transplant that there are. So. The first type that you might have heard of is autologous. So this is actually where we harvest the stem cells from a patient who's suffering from an illness. Uh, that's their own stem cells, so it's their self. We then condition their bone marrow and then, uh, so it's the existing bone marrow is pretty much destroyed. And then new uh, stem cells, their own stem cells are infused back in. And, and they can be particularly important for the treatment of lymphomas or myeloma, where the origin of those diseases is not necessarily in the bone marrow. Um, the other type is uh, allogeneic, and this is what you've had, Julia. So this is a HLA match donor that could be related or indeed unrelated, and it's their stem cells or their blood stem cells. But it could also be cord blood as well. I just want to make that point um, because cord blood 
when you're born is an incredibly rich source of blood stem cells. Some people choose to have their cord bloods banked at birth, just in case they're needed later in life. And that's also happens following a, a period of bone marrow conditioning. And the final type that you can have is syngenetic. Uh, so this is stem cells from uh, an identical twin, which is again infused back in after uh, some bone marrow conditioning. Um, so, um, did I actually share the screen through that? I didn't see anything being shared. No, oh, that's my fault. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly show you uh, the screen because I just did all that without. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is the um, stem cell donation facts that I was just banging on about, you know, the, the frequency, the amount that are needed. You can get all this from the uh, anti Nolan website as well. They've got some fantastic resources. Um, you also have uh, the, the need uh, for um, five people every day that are searching for a matching unrelated stem cell donor. Um, and then of course we have this real need that comes for BAME patients as well and young males to join the register. And these were just the, just you can see how they're spelt, the autologous, the allogeneic and the, the syngeneic um, stem cell transplants that you can have. Um, so if I stop share and go back to you Julia so obviously what we are what did you really know about I mean we talked briefly your A-level biology but was any more explained to you about what what stem cells were what they meant what they were going to mean for you during this treatment um yeah so they explained that it was actually nothing like an operation or it wasn't a sort of big thing where I need to be under general anesthesia or anything. It was that, it was just sort of an infusion, like I'd heard a blood transfusion or a platelet transfusion before. Um, and it just goes in through a cannula and it's really as simple as that, which I just found astounding. Yeah. That something sort of as life-saving as that can be so simple. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So how long were you, from the, from the moment sort of stem cell transplant was mentioned, how, how long were you, were, were you, were there any fears? Did you think, oh, what if we can't find a match? Was, how was that communicated with you? I think that obviously everyone has worries when they're told something really serious, but I had such faith in the system that I wasn't ever really worried about um, not finding a match. The, the nurses and the doctors that handled me were just sort of as positive as they could be. And they yeah. framed it in such a way that I sort of, I, I trusted them completely and also I know I'm in quite a, pri a privileged position to not be um, in a vein category where it's really difficult to find a match yeah. Um, but yeah I sort of I was I guess I was just lucky with the people that sort of told me and handled me and just sort of made it seem like it was going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a credit to the, your, your care team really isn't it for communicating everything and um, you know making you feel at ease it must have been a very scary time Definitely. Um, so, how long do you know how, how long you were waiting roughly before that match was done? Um, about a month in, they told me that they'd found a match who was 10 out of 10 for me uh, with HLA in reference to that. But um, the donor was CMB positive and I was CMB negative. Yeah, so we talked about this last night, didn't we? It's, it's not just HLA type and we also like to match um, cytomegalovirus status don't we because uh, this is a virus that humans normally deal with no problem they've got healthy immune systems but the virus can wreak havoc in immunocompromised people like yourself so yeah that was an additional care check I guess. Yeah so they were really worried about that being an issue and they actually decided to abandon that donor and, and look for another one um, because they want they were so worried about the CMB match um, being an issue and then in the end, it took about three months to find the donor that I had, um, who ended up being nine out of ten, which they still consider to be good enough and pretty yeah. good. And I mean, it worked so far because so I'm still here. So, <laughs> I mean, three months that must have still felt. I mean, it's twelve weeks. It still must have felt a little bit. Uh, yeah, because you're not doing much. You're not busy. You must have been thinking. Yeah. Find a donor. Were you worried? I think that in the moment sort of I, I had two cycles of chemo and a lot of the time I was super tired and fatigued and I was going between being in the hospital and being at home and I I was so sort of busy with not feeling well that I, I guess I wasn't actually thinking about it that much but in retrospect I probably could have thought about it a lot more 
Um, but it's sort of, I kind of just, I don't want to say put it on the back burner, but I sort of trusted that they... <laughs> it would be all right. Know, then, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's hard to worry about something that's sort of out of your control, isn't it? You know, yeah, it? yeah. Um, so talk about it then, the, the day of the transplant. So the donor's been found. We talked about this with Alistair last night. You know, they've had their GCSF injections. The transplant date has been planned. Um, what do you remember about that day? So the day, I mean, I woke up at a pretty normal time for the ward because everyone's sort of super tired. I'd work about 10, 10.30 had a shower and then a doctor came in and put a cannula in my left, top of my left hand just here. Um, and then it must have been about 12 that um, I had my brother there and my bro other brother was at school so we FaceTimed him in, both my parents were there and I also had two special specialist nurses and um, were there to kind of oversee the process to make sure the cells went in okay. And then they brought in a bag, must have been I don't know, 300 mils or so. Yeah. Water, sort of like milky blood yeah um and they attached it and that was it and then the actual it took about an hour and a half for the cells to go in um yeah. to be infused into your into your arm yeah into my yeah exactly and i were, it was pretty horrible i mean i i threw up most of the time wow. pretty much for an hour and a half and then i slept for the rest of the day so the actual transplant day was kind of underwhelming and pretty horrific <laughs> yeah I mean, I've, I've watched a younger brother go through that and it is, it is horrible to watch someone you love go through that. I mean, I remember we, we were watching a Six Nations rugby match at the time because we've got Welsh heritage, which is obviously quite important to us. And it was Wales versus England, which is the biggest game of all. Wow. None of us could concentrate because just yeah. watching someone just spewing their guts into... Um, yeah. <laughs> well, when there's nothing left to throw up as well, it's just... Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, uh, it, it, it's horrible, but I guess you're appreciating the, um, what's actually happening um, is, is going to be good for you, I guess. Definitely. Um, so while we're at this sort of point, I just thought, again, I'd share my screen and just talk about what's going on with uh, that part of the um, stem cell donation. So this is just a brief overview. Uh, of roughly what happens during this stem cell transplant. So we've got the donor side here and then the recipient side here. So as we talked about last night, Alistair would have had GCSF injections to boost the number of his stem cells. These would then be collected by apheresis. Um, we've got here that they're stored in the lab. They would be stored, they wouldn't necessarily be frozen. I think we like to keep them fresh. Um, and then in the meanwhile, what's happening and would have been happening with Julia is she would have been having a conditioning regime or, or drugs that sort of almost completely wipe out her existing marrow. So completely at risk, you know, very vulnerable to any sort of small infection at that point. Um, and then what happens, um, so I've got a little diagram here. We've got a little stem cell as a, a representative in this, in, this, uh, in this donor bag. And remember last night we talked about um, this important molecule called CXCL12, which is secreted in the bone marrow. And when this uh, protein is, is secreted, it gives a signal to stem cells uh, that to, to where they should be in the body. And I, I really do find this completely magical that you can inject something into the arm that belongs in the bone marrow. And what it will do, it will sense the concentration of CXCL12 and it will naturally home to the bone marrow. And there it will completely establish a, a new blood system, a new healthy blood system, which uh, obviously, of course, Julia had. And then the Supportive care is quite intense, I think, for about a month or so, um, because you have to wait for the new blood system to establish itself, and you are really vulnerable to even the, the smallest infections can be deadly. You really do have to, I don't know if you find this, Julie, you have to live your life in a bubble, really, don't you? Yeah, so when I had the transplant, I was, um, I was in my own room on my ward, sort of a side room, um, and everyone that came in had to wear, well, not everyone, sort of the nurses and doctors, um, had to wear gloves and a sort of protective apron just in case they'd gone into another room with another patient and yeah. cross something over. Um, and then I didn't leave the room for about three weeks. Wow, so I mean, that's worse than COVID lockdown, isn't it? I mean, at least <laughs> you can move around your house, you can go in your garden. Well, you no, I got pretty used to it last year. So I'm actually nailing this lockdown at the moment. 
complete freedom for you, isn't it? COVID lockdown. Yeah, that's great. I can go to the kitchen. I can go to my bedroom. It's, you know, so many rooms. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, so I didn't leave the room for about three weeks. And uh, everyone that came, if someone, if one of my friends was coming and they had a cold, I, they couldn't come. And um, everyone had to be really careful about uh, if they were, knew they were coming into contact with me, that they couldn't sort of be ill and had to wash their hands and that sort of thing. Yeah. I bet your parents were really worried, wouldn't you? Because you'd be worried as a parent, you know, you've watched your daughter go through this and have this life-saving treatment and you just, I'd want to hug you loads, but I'd also not want to go near you. It's, it must yeah, have been, it's sort of a fine line. <laughs> it must have been really tricky. Um, yeah. So that's the transplant then. Um, so any immediate sort of complications? Because we talked about last night, graft versus host disease, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously a big consideration. Um, where the new blood system, you know, if you haven't, it sounds like you had a nine out of 10 match, so not a perfect match. So if there are tissues in the body that the new immune system doesn't recognize, you can start to get inflammation and, um, you know, attack of your own body tissue. Yeah. Um, but I will just say as well, there's a very desirable effect from that as well, which is called um, graft versus leukemia effect. So as well as your new immune system, maybe not recognizing some body cells, it also doesn't recognize any leukemia cells that might still be around. So this is one of the reasons why an allergenic uh, transplant can be so curative is that it actually attacks and destroys the residual leukemia, which is there. So a little bit of that graft versus host disease is, is actually quite desirable, but how did you get it badly? How, how was it for you? Um, I actually had quite mild graft versus host disease. Um, I, it probably started maybe a week after, maybe actually ten, sort of 10 days, uh, two weeks after the transplant. Um, in the kind of the week afterwards, I, I got these really sudden sort of like hot legs and red legs. And then I get sort of like bone pain almost sort of inside and joint pain. And we can only assume that that was the cells sort of moving in. Yeah. So to speak. And then, yeah, sort of two weeks, three weeks afterwards, I got, um, rashes. I usually got them on my neck here. Um, and it's sort of like flaky red skin and they gave me a steroid cream and it went away um and then i i had really really dry skin um for a month or so but again steroid cream kind of solved that so i was quite lucky i had it uh quite mild the graft versus host not too bad okay that's that's good to hear so coming up to a very special anniversary for you isn't it i mean is it it's yeah. what's the date it was it's in june actually mid-june so <laughs> mid-june so we were nearly one year post transplant yeah it's still in transplant terms we're still very young aren't we it's um it's not long really yeah it sort of feels like three years and also two months at the same time i don't sort of time kind of becomes a bit of a blur yeah yeah um so how are you feeling now i mean you look fantastic thank you <laughs> um, you look very healthy you look you know the hair's your hair looks great you were telling me about that before the key yeah program. no my hair's great i was gonna say it's grown back incredibly curly i didn't really have curly hair before it's never been this short before but sort of it was pretty straight before um but apparently that's the thing that happens with chemo and you know maybe with transplants that it comes back really thick and dark and curly so i've been blessed with curly hair now and you know i come what may um, <laughs> yeah so at the moment i'm feeling i'm pretty okay um i think i still kind of feel a bit foggy from the radiotherapy in terms of studying and sort of memory retention isn't as good as it used to be but again I can only assume that'll get better with as the months go along. Um, I'm still on a prophylactic medicine to make sure I don't relapse. Um, it's called serafinib and it's actually used to treat other cancers but it's shown to prevent relapse in FIT3 positive patients. Yep. Um, and it's only really kind of come onto the FLT3 radar in the last few months or years and you know, I, I'm just so incredibly grateful that technology and medicine and research has progressed to a point where I'm able to use medicines that have been approved in the last couple of years. Yeah, it's a fast, it's a fast moving field, especially the type of kinase inhibitor that you mentioned there, serafinib. I mean, it's, yeah. I think you, you said you got it and it only just, after that, it was shortly approved by the government, wasn't it, to be? Uh, to be um, I'm not sure that it's been nice approved for all AML patients yet. Um, but the study that prompted it showed a significant increase in survival and yeah. less relapse um, for patients who had my mutation. 
Um, you're, still, you're still taking this daily, yeah? Yeah, it's two tablets twice a day, so four in total. Um, and I think the study recommends being on it for up to two years. Um, the study was actually discontinued. Um, they stopped recruiting more patients because it was so obvious that it was a game they couldn't changer, give it to yeah. anymore. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, so what sort of monitoring things are in place? Do you go into the hospital less regularly now? or? Um, so I'm still going in once a month, mainly because I'm still on serafinib and they need to check my blood counts because it can affect um, a lot of those. So I think if I wasn't on serafinib, it would maybe be once every three months or so that I'd be going in. But at the moment, I'm going in monthly. And every three months, I have a biopsy to make sure that everything is as it should be in there. Um, usually, I think they said that they wouldn't normally do a biopsy um, because you would see it in the blood counts that something not, isn't right. But because I had some pretty aggressive mutations, they decided that it might be best to just sort of catch it earlier, so, you know, sooner rather than later, basically. Cool. Um, so do you know any details of your donor? You, you, obviously, we go into this anonymized period now of two years. Yeah. Or you're into it. Um, do you know, they do let you know, sometimes know the sex and if they're British or... or so British. all that I know about my donor is that he's is a male, it's a he. Um, I don't know where he's from, I don't know how old he is, and I, I really don't know much else. Um, I mean, I know his blood type because it's now my blood type because... Yeah. Obviously, his stem cells are producing my blood. So <laughs> we, we talked about this last night. It must be weird knowing that you have male cells inside you. You've got a Y chromosome floating about there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, like you said yesterday, I could now commit a crime and nobody would know because it wouldn't be. <laughs> <there. laughs> Take that box. <laughs> See, this, this poor male with his, his blood being splattered all over <laughs> the, the crime scene. Yeah, you, you, you should behave. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so do you think after... The two years that you might want to make contact with the donor or do you think you want to leave it longer how, how do, you, do you think you want to meet at all or how, are you, how are you feeling about I, I don't know how i'll be feeling in a couple of years time but i think it would be at least nice to sort of send them a, a, a note or a letter saying that i'm, I'm doing okay at the moment and sort yeah. of I'm, I'm back to normal life as much as i can and yeah and it, it worked basically for the time being you know yeah i, I think it's you know, certainly from my perspective, I, you know, you wouldn't want to be counting your chickens, would you? You'd be kind of thinking, I'm not going to celebrate because there's a, there's a long way to go. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. Some people don't want to contact at all. They just want to sort of leave that chapter of life behind and you can totally understand why, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're nearly coming up to our, our hour now. Um, so we'll, we'll come on to some questions. Um, I mean, first of all, just do you, do you want to just finish? I mean, it should be evident for anyone who's watching this. And uh, thanks again for everyone who's turned up tonight to, to hear your story. Um, but is there anything you just want to finish saying about stem cell donation? Just that it's, it's so easy to be on the registry. It's literally just a cheek swab at first. And I know I'm slightly biased, obviously. But, um, it, you know, having a lot of people on the registry to begin with is so important so that someone can find a match not just you know someone who's on the registry so you'll join you know having so, so many people on it in the database to begin with is super super important yeah yeah absolutely well said um might just get you to say hello to alistair alistair's on this call i think alistair was our donor from last night um yeah. there alistair if i un unmute you um can you turn your video on as well alistair hello say hello Hello, Hello, sir. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm well. How are you? Oh, good, thanks. Good. Good. I thought that was uh, that was fantastic. Really interesting to uh, to hear things from from your side. Um, and again, I just wanted just for anyone who wasn't here at the start, I wanted to say that Alistair did not donate stem cells to Julia. This is definitely a completely separate um, donation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Alistair. Uh, Cut you off then. No, no, it's it's absolutely fine. I thought it's it's incredible. You've uh, you've had a rough time, um, but yeah, uh, it's it's yeah, it's it's incredible to to see how how well you're doing now. Um, yeah, and I think you're doing a great job, sort of sharing your story and and, and raising the awareness from from your point of view. Oh, thank I guess you. A, a, a question I, I had um, hypothetically would 
Would you be able to, to be a, a donor yourself? I don't think so. I think the rules are pretty clear that because I've had a cancer, um, I couldn't donate. I don't even think I'm allowed to donate blood anymore. Um, right. Reason. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just interested. No, we, we did talk about this on the phone, didn't we, Julia? Because you, you, you said you felt a bit deflated because you can't donate blood. You can't do, you can't donate stem cells. Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing that I tried to tell you was that you, you now have the opportunity to, to do so much good in a different way. You know, you can, with one stem cell donation, you can only help one person. But, you know, with your story, and I think you said you want to get much more involved with sort of plug-in stem cell donation, you, you can potentially hit tens, twenties, hundreds of people. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, with the care I had, it was just, it was just amazing, you know, you know, from the NHS and also the care I had from my parents and my, my friends. And I had so many blood transfusions and so many plate transfusions. And like you said, it was a very expensive sort of procedure to go through and sort of not being able to do the same for someone else is sort of a bit, <laughs> it's sort yeah. of nothing in a way, but yeah, if, if I can do anything for someone else, I'd, I'd be there in a heartbeat. No, that's, that's, that's good to hear. Um, so we'll just check the uh, chat bar now. So again, for anyone who's on Zoom, um, down below is um, a chat bar. If you want to type in any questions there, please do. Um, we can ask them. We've got 10 or so minutes left. Um, there's one here from Tommy. Julia, how did you keep so focused, calm and in the zone whilst all your cherished loved ones were worried and sick about you? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think I was sort of blessed with this positive go for it attitude and I remember I mean on the day when I found out I cried a lot and my flatmate cried a lot with me and we sort of cried together and then once we cried it all out we were just laughing because it was so ridiculous that we <laughs> didn't know what else to do and then from then on it was sort of what's my job what can I do get better okay let's do that you know what's the next step yeah um, you've almost compartmentalized things and yeah yeah definitely and sort of not thinking oh you know I won't be able to go back to uni for another year or oh I won't be able to do this for six months it was sort of okay what's the next step okay you've got chemo in two days then in two weeks we'll see what's yeah. up then the next month is chemo again then you know so little baby steps I suppose really helped That's a really good way of dealing with it um question here from Maria what was the scariest part of being told you need a transplant um, I think probably the fact that all my childhood vaccinations would just be wiped, um, because when you go through the conditioning, um, it wipes out your bone marrow to make way for the new cells. Um, so when I recover, I'd have a working immune system, probably not for a year or so. Um, but it means that I won't have any memory from my childhood vaccination. So, you know, even taking the tube, for example, um, if I caught measles or rubella or mumps, you know, it could be anywhere. Most people are vaccinated anyway, so it's not really an issue for them. Um, but the first six months or so, um, I was also on immunosuppressants after my transplant. So I had to be really careful about going inside places and being near large groups of people. Yeah, good, good advice. So that, yeah. Um, so Tommy asks, I mean, first he states with, you are so heroic. <laughs> I agree. Uh, what advice would you give to a young person who is suddenly diagnosed with leukemia? And secondly, what's your relationship with Anthony Nolan at the moment? So, if I met someone who'd just been diagnosed, there's not much you can say to someone on the day or sort of a week after. Just, that, I mean, you know, you can't say it's going to be okay because you don't know that it will. And you can't sort of like revel in the, the terrifying, horrible nature of what's just happened to you but I would just honestly one day at a time is all you can do yeah. knowing that tomorrow it might be better it might be worse but let's hope tomorrow is better and if it is better great there was a better day than yesterday yeah. and you know that's that's really all you can do just take it baby steps at a time and and don't worry about things five years into the future or two years into the future just focus on the now it's so important and, uh, with Anthony Nolan I I've only re actually received a comment from them on my transplant day. Oh. They, they call it having a second birthday, um, oh. I guess, because you have a new immune system. So they said, happy, happy birthday. <laughs> um, but other than that, I haven't really been um, involved with them. But that's something that I definitely want to do in the future and, and sort of plug more events like this. We tried to get you in contact with or get you working with the Marrow groups, didn't we, which are on university campuses, which were yeah. So I think that would be a, 
a great route for you if you wanted to start getting into it. Uh, yeah. Keith says, I think you're an amazing ambassador for encouraging young people to donate, Julia. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. That's my teacher from my old school. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, Maria says, again, you definitely convinced me to become a donor, so that's fantastic. Did you get the vaccines again, she asked. So they don't vaccinate you until they think your immune system can produce a full response. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that's because, so I'm 11 months and 11 and a half months post transplant now. Um, and they say it takes between 12 and 18 months for your immune system to kind of develop enough to be able to create memory cells when you have a vaccination. Yeah. Um, so I think I probably won't be having my vaccinations for another few months, given my blood results at the moment. Um, so it's just this last push until I can get revaccinated and feel so a bit more normal again. <laughs> yeah, stay indoors. It's fine. Um, is Keith asked, is Anti Nolan Trust using social media to reach young people and encourage their interest? Um, Anti Nolan are absolutely all over social media, which is fantastic. And he thinks you'd be great in that, Julia. So you should definitely do that. Stephanie says, Julia, thank you generously sharing your experience and insights with us. We're extremely proud of you and commend your courage and generosity in sharing your story. We are grateful for your return to good health and continue to uphold you in prayer. It's lovely. Thank you. Uh, Roll <laughs> and Lenkola, I hope I said that right. You've encouraged me to be a donor. Uh, it is even more important for me to do here in that there needs to be uh, more people of colour to do so. Absolutely. These are the vain patients we were talking about. Uh, please give advice on best how to do so. Uh, we're happy to see you healthy and thinking of ways to give back. Um, I don't know what country you're in, Ro or Lincoln, but whichever country you're in, they'll have their uh, bone marrow registries or stem cell registers that you can join. Uh, Keith again says, uh, proud of you, Julia. Uh, <laughs> Marilena, hi, Julia. What activity, hobby helped you a lot during your treatment? Something that helped your mind to stay positive? Um, you know, in a way, so I, I'm... I'm lucky that I grew up in a very musical family and sort of music meant so much to me that I didn't really want to associate it with a bad time. So I actually tried not to listen to music and, and not to watch a series because I know that if I saw it again, I just think of sort of being in the hospital and that sort of stuff. Um, it sounds funny, but sort of being in the hospital all day, you do kind of get busy. You know, as you wake up, then the nurse checks your pulse, she checks your blood pressure, then maybe you have bloods taken, then maybe you need to go for an ultrasound, you need to go for a scan, or um, someone's coming to visit, or I don't know, sort of consultancy from another department or something. So it's, I wasn't, I was never really bored and, you know, if tired, I'd take a nap or something. So I actually somehow got pretty busy. I didn't really take up any new hobbies. I got given a lot of books, yeah. um, which I tried, tried to work my way through. <laughs> Um, but I, yeah, I sort of, I think I tried to avoid music, um, just so I had something nice to come back to in the way, in the end. Yeah, a bit of Ollie Mirrors, that makes me feel better. Um, question from just an iPhone, don't know who it is, but is the search for a donor worldwide? Um, it is indeed, so a lot of these bone marrow registries, in, internationally, they all talk to each other, they're all communicating with, you know, they all have access to each other's systems. Um, so very often a lot of our donors come from Germany because the, um, there's so many people registered on the stem cell registers in Germany. Um, Daniel Conway says, I'll get you in touch with Cardiff Marrow if you want. Fantastic. <laughs> um, how's your life outside of the illness changed since you were diagnosed? So for the moment, it's still pretty much the shielding um, and the staying away from large groups, especially uh, now at the moment. Um, I remember at the university, obviously, because I worked there, I, I got an email saying that you were then staying away. As soon as COVID was around, you were staying away from lectures. You were going to do your learning from home, which was yeah. sensible. Yeah, so the university was incredibly supportive about it and, you know, I said I didn't need to come into lectures because they were recorded and I could stay away as much as I needed to for my health, um, not to risk sort of maybe catching COVID because that probably wouldn't end well for me. <laughs> um, Andrew says, Dear Julia, thank you for sharing your experience with all of us. You've been and you are really a really strong girl. I could not expect anything else knowing your incredible parents and family. Keep going on your beautiful way of life and enjoying what you gain from your lucky and successful experience. Oh. <laughs> You're a little legend, doing so well. <laughs> and just see. It must have been very difficult. So Andrew says it must have been very difficult to relive uh, all the progression. You showed amazing strength all through the process. I never saw you overwhelmed. But take it that's a family member of some kind, is it? Yeah, it's well, he's, he's a family friend of ours, yeah. Fantastic. Um, another question at the end. Does it cost money to test blood and be registered as a potential donor? Um, for the donor. So absolutely no cost to the donor at all. 
it costs Anti Nolan roughly forty pounds to put someone on the register because of the administrative costs and the cost of doing the lab work, the HLA typing. Um, so, if you ever get a chance to give Anthony Nolan some money, do ahead, go ahead and donate. Uh, forty pounds should cover one donation. So, um, yeah, but no cost to the donor at all. And during the process as well, all expenses are paid for the donor. Any travel, any overnight stay any loss of earnings for your work uh, is all covered. So um, that's not a reason not to join. Um, okay, so that's the end of the questions. Uh, I just wanna get one more point across before I finish, going back to my presentation. So this is again more for people in the UK, uh, but there are a variety of bone marrow registers that you can join. The British Bone Marrow Registry takes people from 17 to 40, DKMS 17 to 55, anti in 16 to 30 and this is the real age group that we need to get onto the registers uh, younger stem cells healthier stem cells to give much better outcomes for transplant patients and obviously if you're on a university campus please uh, seek out your nearest marrow group um anti nolan launched uh, this week the lockdown lifesaver challenge so with covid19 around um donations potential uh, recruits uh, everything's down so we really want to use the social media to try and boost uh, stem cell to get people onto the stem cell registers. Uh, so whichever WhatsApp groups you're in, any Facebook groups, do, sh do share this information here. Tell them all about what's involved with a stem cell transplant and just how easy it is. Um, and finally, uh, being involved with some AML research, I just want to plug some charities in the UK that are doing fantastic work for uh, research, but not just uh, research into blood cancers, but also the the more of the sort of the pastoral care as well, groups like Macmillan and Teenage Cancer Trust uh, doing fantastic work with young people who have these terrible illnesses. Um, but yeah, if you get a chance to donate to any of these, um, your money will be well spent. Um, yeah, so I'll stop sharing there, go back to Zoom. Um, and let's just see, there's a couple more. Dan Ronstein says, unfortunately, there isn't an opt-out registry for bone marrow donations. Indeed, Dan, that is a shame, um, despite it being as simple as a slightly more involved blood donation, which it is. It is just a glorified blood donation. Um, and it can have a life an effect on anyone who has it. Um, as a family, we kept together by this. I cannot say how grateful we are for what was done by the doctors and nurses at UCLH and the Teenage Cancer Ward and for Anthony Nolan Organization for being there when we needed the most. Well said, Dan. I think that's your dad, isn't it, Julia? Yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, and Alistair says, uh, thank you to me. Thank you very much, Alistair, for arranging this. Um, but I think we'll just finish saying thank you to you, actually. Uh, so, Alistair, can you, can you flip your video back on and I'll unmute you? Hello there. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, big, big thank you to Alistair for last night um thanks for getting involved no really, really appreciate you sharing your story i uh, hope to see a lot more of you um, um, yeah you. keep plugging the message um and thanks to you julia um for doing the recipient story for us of course i'm so happy to do it like i said any anything <laughs> i can give back at this point is you know it's i mean you know they saved my life <laughs> yeah i mean you are uh, an inspiration and it's been uh pretty difficult not to cry at some points during this uh, because <laughs> you are yeah you, what you've done is amazing uh, if you can get involved with those um you know those sort of registries or marrow or anti nolan i think they you know you, your story will be well received and i think we'll get a lot of people signed up it's on my list for sure put it on your long list but don't forget this week revision you got your exams this week so yeah, i do i, I do <laughs> Back to do enough. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. Get back to it, and I hope to see you again around campus sometime. Not at the moment. Stay away. Um, Not at the moment, but next year I'll be knocking on your door. <laughs> <laughs> Come and see the lab. Um, yeah. So thanks to everyone for being in attendance tonight. This session was recorded. We will upload it to social media at some point once it's been clipped and edited. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of your bank holiday evenings. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.